The last big idea that we want to share with you is about unifying the park, a concept that is embedded in all of the design proposals you've just heard. We see achieving unity in three important ways. For too long, Franklin Park's story has been about what has been taken away or carved out of the parkland, resulting in what we initially referred to as the Swiss cheese effect. This is a moment to reframe that narrative and shift the collective mindset around the park. Franklin Park is a 520 acre historic park with an award-winning golf course, a stadium, and Boston Zoo. We must think of it as one place that celebrates all it has to offer, which means working with these partners to achieve mutually beneficial results with the whole park in mind. The second way to unify is more practical. There are many physical barriers within the park today, whether it be fences, overgrown vegetation, granite boulders or locked gates. These barriers don't send an inviting message in a place that should be welcoming to all. Sometimes these barriers are required like the fence around the zoo, but could be relocated or rethought to create a more appealing edge. Others may not be necessary at all, like the fence at Shattuck or White Stadium. Breaking down these barriers can be addressed through small incremental steps, ultimately adding up to an improved experience of the park. The last means of unifying the park is a management of the park's ecologies, the great unifier, you might say. No matter where or how you enjoy the park, you're experiencing one of its incredible landscape types. Like the physical barriers, improving the park's ecology must use strategies that work across boundaries. These recommendations fall into four categories. Woodlands make up almost half of the park's iconic landscape but years of no active management means that species diversity is low and there's no reliable next generation of canopy trees emerging on the forest floor. The invasive species must be managed to induce regeneration of the extensive oak hickory and beech canopy. And woodlands that have been segmented into disparate pieces must be reconnected through layers of new planting to improve habitat. The park's open fields and lawns have been loved to death. We must improve soils through grading, aeration and amendments to improve drainage and increased long-term durability to support their active year-round use. And of course, we also have to consider the preservation of the park's her heritage trees, which line open spaces and circulation paths, many of which date to the 19th century. Their care through pruning and pest treatments is an essential part of the preservation of the park. We must also seek out spaces to introduce biodiversity and to slow stormwater runoff without impacting carriers of activity, circulation and use. Opportunities for buffer habitats like wet and dry meadows exist where woodlands meet open areas. Incorporating flowering and fruiting plants for seasonal display can also serve as a food source for park wildlife. Buffers also serve as green infrastructure and can be integrated into parking areas along roadways and primary paths and within wet meadows to intercept stormwater before it re reaches the park's undersized and aging drainage infrastructure. The pond at Scarborough serves as the last stop for stormwater before it exits the park, growing the vegetated shoreline, treating water from its outfalls and providing selective access points to the water's edge will minimize erosion and compaction and increase water quality. Thank you for listening as we share the four big ideas underlying the plan's recommendations. We really look forward to your feedback. Like Liza said, these action plan recommendations will ultimately be realized through a series of capital projects. We need your help to prioritize the anticipated projects so we can identify a timeline and budget. Today, we reviewed the overall vision and in later meetings, we'll tackle next the strategies for implementing this vision.